Jasmine Shaisha for inviting me to be here today. And the talk is going to be on meaning of state binders. And uh, the agenda will include the state on the status in the city. The problem of the state treatment of hyperphosphemia, phosphate binders, and how prescribed. Well, um, without going into many details, the phosphorus that we have in the blood comes from the food we eat. And it is excreted through the kidney, and 90% will be reabsorbed. And the process of absorption and reabsorption depends upon a sodium phosphorus co-transport system that in itself is going to be a target of therapy, as we are going to see later. Serum phosphorus levels are maintained in the normal range at different stages of CKD until very late after stage of uh, less than 13 mils per minute, it's going to be inevitably increased. But if you notice here, there is always a tendency early on to have increased phosphorus as evidenced by the increased PTH and FS, FGF23 that is phosphaturic. And in this this is a study that was carried in over 3,000 patients and it included patients in stage 2 to 5 CKD and it showed that the higher the phosphorus, the greater was the mortality. It showed that uh, every 1 milligram per deciliter increase in serum phosphorus is associated with 37 to 54% increased likelihood of mortality. And it is as an important predictor just as advancing age, having diabetes mellitus, congestive heart failure, CKD stages four and five, lower hemoglobin, so it has a very predictive, uh, is a very predictive of mortality. In this study, it was done on more than 4,000 patients and they were CKD stage 2 only. And they worried about it, it was over uh, five years, and they worried about it in curve times depending on the level of serum phosphorus. And it was noticed that those at the higher curve time, even their phosphorus was high normal, not necessarily above normal, there was again increased likelihood to all-cause mortality, coronary deaths or non fatal myocardial infarction, and new congestive heart failure. Now this is another study which is the Framingham study. It was done on a big number of patients, more than 3,000, and those patients had no CKD and they had no cardiovascular risk at all. And it again showed that the higher the phosphorus, the more the likelihood of mortality. So phosphorus does not seem to be good for cardiovascular stability. And now we look to the dialysis patients and relation of phosphorus to mortality. You can see that it is a U-shaped curve. The higher the phosphorus, the greater the mortality, and also the lower phosphorus is associated with increased mortality, probably due to malnutrition. So the message is, phosphorus is one of the most toxic substances in uh, uremia, and it is very much related to mortality. So, uh, why is that? Why is phosphorus related to mortality and cardiovascular disease? We're actually, when we have influx of phosphorus into the vascular smooth muscle cells, it causes gene regulation and results in trans differentiation of the cell into 
osteoblast phenotype that starts to secrete alkaline phosphatase and calcium binding proteins and type 1 bone specific collagen and even calcium phosphate loaded matrix vesicles. So we get vascular calcification and here you, you'll be astonished that a, a very big number of patients, of CKD patients, before even they start dialysis, they have these vascular calcifications. Between 50 and 100% of patients, CKD stage 3 to 5, have vascular calcifications, which could be internal or medial, as shown by special stains. So it's very challenging that we have to reduce the phosphorus, uh, the high phosphorus, and we have many measures to do so. And of course, you know that we face this problem in, in later stages of CKD. So we have to do with the diet, which alone is not enough. We have to include phosphate binders, and we have to do dialysis intensification. It's better to increase the number of dialysis settings than increasing the duration of dialysis. And finally, we can go to treat hyperparathyroidism. Now, why is it that diet alone is not enough? Well, actually, as you can see, phosphorus is present in almost most of the diet that we eat. And you will find that the patients will not be compliant. And even if they are compliant, they will go into routine calorie malnutrition, which itself is bad prognostic for morbidity and mortality. But we can be smart enough to choose the kind of food that, is, have, that has a lower phosphate to protein ratio. For instance, egg white has 1.4 milligram phosphorus per gram protein, and whey protein is 3 milligram phosphorus per gram protein. So now you are giving a high uh, quality diet, protein rich diet with less phosphorus uh, burden. And you have to get away from the kind of foods that have phosphate additives that are usually used for emulsification, for shelf life, freeze, so stability, to give moisture, color, tenderness, etc. Remember that this kind of phosphate, they are the ones that are readily absorbed, almost all absorbed, highly absorbed, fully absorbed. So these are the ones that we have to insist on the patients not taking them. And this is the prevalence of foods with phosphate additives, like prepared frozen food, 72%, packaged meat, 65%, <coughs> and so on and so forth. We also have enhanced meat and poultry products by injection of solution of water with sodium and potassium salts, particularly the space. So this is also has to be uh, excluded from the diet. Beverages, very important source, and of course the fast foods. So also you have to remember that some drugs, they contain phosphates like amlodipine, clonidipine, lysinopril, paroxetine, cetagliptin, ribaglinide, bisoprolol, rosuvastatin. So we have to take care when we prescribe drugs to our patients if they have phosphorus or not. So this makes uh, the use of phosphate binders mandatory if we are to control the level of uh, high phosphorus and we can divide the phosphate binders into three categories. We have the metal base which is the aluminium, the calcium and iron and we have the non-metal base, sevenomer, ixalomer which is only present in Japan and lantana. And finally we have the novel binders like the shichuzan containing chewing gums and niacin. Whatever drug you use, whatever phosphate binder you use, they all are efficient in reducing the level of high serum phosphorus to the recommended level. But you have to adjust the dosing of the phosphate binder and you have to make sure that the patient
patient is compliant. Because this is a French study here and it shows you that only 49% of patients in the green, they have, they can maintain the phosphorus in the recommended those uh, level of 3.5 to 5.5 milligram per deciliter, whereas most of the patients have either low phosphorus uh, or high phosphorus level. So, to have an ideal state binder, it has to be, first of all, effective. It should bind dietary state regardless of pH, with minimum systemic absorption, few side effects, good palatability, low pill burden and low cost. The idea of the sweet binders is that they bind phosphorus in the gut and they form compounds that are excreted in the feces. But actually what happens is that many of those binders undergo some absorption like uh, the aluminium, the calcium, the iron, lanthanum, and sebalamir, and of course this effect is far from being desired. So when phosphate binders was first introduced, it was the aluminium-based uh, binders, and they were very effective, but we had the problem of aluminium intoxication. So they now should only be used only for salvage treatment and for short duration, not to be used uh, routinely. Then in the 1980s we came, uh, came the calcium binders and again they are effective and they are not expensive but we are faced with the problem of hypercalcemia and definitely they should not be used in patients with vascular calcification. And 2001, Sevelamir hydrochloride was introduced and here we have no hypercalcemia, we have no, this, we don't have this problem and it has got also other pleiotropic effects like reduction of LDL cholesterol and others, but the release of hydrochloride increases the acid burden for the patients and will contribute to metabolic acidosis and this has been solved with sevelamir carbonate that was introduced later on but is not always available. Well, Sender Mayer has also the problem of increased pill burden and is expensive. And this is one of the first phosphate binders that are non-metal based. Then we have the lanthanum carbonate, which is again a non-metal based binder. It uh, has a low pill burden uh, in comparison to the civil amir, but the problem is that it is still expensive. And if you notice, you will find that GITF sets are present in all phosphate binders. Now back again to the uh, metal-based binders, we have the iron-based phosphate binders that were introduced in 2014. We have the sucroferic uh, oxyhydroxide, and this one has a low pill burden and is not absorbed, uh, no much iron is absorbed, so it does not affect the iron parameters in the blood. But we have the problem of GIT upsets and the problem of costs. We also have ferric citrate, uh, zeramis or uh, atorexia, and this one has increased iron absorption and has an increased pill burden so it can only be used in patients who are iron deficient. So we cannot say that we have reached to an ideal binder yet, as you can see here. And we have some of the new binders. We have uh, Linazor, calcium acetate, magnesium carbonate combinations. We have uh, Colistilan and Bixalomer. These are only present in Japan. Bixalomer is very much similar to Sevelomer. We have Shituzen chewing gums, which binds salivary phosphate, and we have niacine, which inhibits sodium-dependent phosphate co-transporters that we had mentioned earlier for the absorption and reabsorption of phosphorus. 
Well, these new drugs are not used alone, actually. Uh, they can be added to the phosphate binders because it has been shown that when you restrict phosphate in the diet and give phosphate binders, there is going to be upregulation of the sodium-dependent phosphate co-transporters, and this is going to increase the absorption of phosphates if the patient misses his medication. So the combination is going to be uh, helpful. So uh, you can you can see here that the presence of hyperglycemia will stimulate pro-calcific pathways, as we mentioned, that will cause the cardiovascular disease and end up in mortality. But then we have to have evidence-based to show us that if you correct the hypoglycemia, the mortality will be reduced. We cannot assume from the physiology what is going to happen. We cannot say that as long as hypoglycemia is bad, then correction of hypoglycemia will be good. We have to prove it that this is going to be good. So let's see what we have in the studies. In this study, it was uh, monitoring the progression of coronary artery calcifications, and it included three groups of patients. The first group uh, received no phosphate binders, they were only treated by diet control, and the second group with calcium-based binders, and the third group with seven layer uh, binder. And you can see that in all groups there was a progression of calcification, of coronary artery calcification, which was very much marked in the group that did not receive the state binder. It was less so in the calcium-based binders and was least in the severe group. So you can see that definitely having a state binder is much better than not having a binder at all. But which binder is the preferred binder? We have actually other studies that contradict these results and you can see also here that the number of patients is not very big. So this is for instance the CARE2 study which also showed that when you compare calcium-based binders to sibilamir, in the first six months sibilamir a reduction in calcium calcification scores is better with sibilamir but if you continue for 12 months they are almost the same. This has to reflect on mortality. Having reduced calcification has to reflect on mortality, and this is the most important thing. And this is the decor study, and it shows here that when you compare calcium to sevenamir, and you have no difference at the end. On the other hand, this is the decor study. This is to compare with the RIN study showing that when you give it long enough, there is going to be uh, difference in mortality. So the problem is that we do need randomized controlled studies that are taking a long time, speaking of mortality, you need years and years to uh, come to a conclusion and we have to have head-to-head -head comparisons and we have to have uh, uh, patients, a control group with no perceived uh, binders to be able to come to a conclusion. Now this is a meta-analysis, a network meta-analysis of randomized trials, and this was published in 2016. And of 2066 citations, it came up with 77 randomized trials that are included in the updated meta-analysis involving 12,000, more than 12,000 patients. Actually, uh, most of them were predominantly on dialysis and they tried almost all phosphate binders. Eight phosphate binders were tried, but the problem is that most had short durations, an average of six months, and there was a high risk of all bias. In this meta-analysis, the primary outcome was all-cause mortality, and the secondary outcome was cardiovascular mortality, myocardial infarction, stroke, adverse events, serum calcium and phosphorus levels, coronary artery calcifications. And the result was that there was no evidence that any drug class lowered mortality 
or cardiovascular event when compared to placebo. But again, I remind you that the duration was, long, was not long enough to conclude that. And compared to calcium, only 7 mAm reduced all-cause mortality. And we don't know if this is because of the bad effect of calcium, or is it because of the good effect of 7 mAm, maybe through reduction of LDL cholesterol, or both. But when one study was removed, which is the independent study, this effect was abolished. It was not there anymore. About the adverse events, you can see that uh, civil mayor was associated mainly with constipation, was the most for constipation, and lantanum was nausea mainly, and of course you can see that calcium is associated with the kind of hypercalcemia that was not there with the non-calcium based binders, and this is conceivable. Well, iron was mainly for diarrhea, but was rated to be the best binder in controlling of uh, phosphates. So now, uh, how to prescribe phosphate binders for hypersystemic patients? So if this is a chronic kidney disease or dialysis patients requiring phosphate binders, so we have to avoid foods with high phosphate to protein ratio, such as processed foods, fast foods, colas, and beverages. And then we ask ourselves the question, does the patient have concomitant conditions such as hypercalcemia, vascular calcification, idiomatic bone disease, or parathyroid hormone that is less than two times the upper limit of normal? If this is so, then you have to avoid calcium-based binders. If this is not so, then you have to choose according to the cost, of course, Calcium and aluminium based binders have lower costs depending on the patient's tolerance, especially speaking of gastrointestinal effects, and depending on the pill burden, because we know that aluminium hydroxide, lanthanum hydrocarbonate, and superfluoric uh, oxy hydroxide, they have a low pill burden. So, in the future, we know that we have not reached to the uh, best binder yet, so search would have to continue. And what is really, really very important is the patient education. You have to educate your patients on why and when and how to use these binders. You have to spend time with the patients talking to him about this important issues so that he would be compliant and you have to assess adherence. So in conclusion, Phosphorus is one of the most important uremic toxins that is related to cardiovascular disease and mortality. Hyperphosphatemia in patients with chronic kidney disease, particularly those on dialysis, can be ameliorated by oral phosphate binders in conjunction with dietary phosphate restriction. Although phosphate binders reduce serum phosphorus in these patients, it remains uncertain whether they improve the clinical outcome. Again, we need longer randomized control trials with head-to-head -head comparisons. The use of aluminium-based binders has been limited by a perceived risk of aluminium accumulation. Calcium-based binders are frequently used, but their popularity is waning due to emerging evidence of accelerated vascular calcification. The non-calcium-based phosphate binders are now available, but are expensive. The pill burden and adverse effects, particularly gastrointestinal intolerance, associated with phosphate binders, often contribute to poor medication adherence. And at the end, I tell you that effective phosphate binder yet discovered is the one that the patient will take. And thank you very much. Thank you, Professor May, for this uh, elegant talk. Uh, and now we are ready for the session. I, I want to stress one, allow me, Professor Ashraf, <laughs> to discuss uh, the uh, one of the important statements that I want to stress upon, and you mentioned it clearly. 
is that uh, phosphate lowering is a complementary surface between looking at food diet is very important. Yes, we want to restrict the proteins for, for homodialis patients because this will lead to malnutrition, but we can get rid of processed foods, Coca-Cola, or these uh, uh, foods, or this, or this, all these materials include in organic phosphorus with absorption capacity 100%. And the more important is the capacity of drugs to bind the phosphate is very limited. So if the patient is not compliant with these points, he should consume a lot of drugs. And this is another problem. So this one of important message that I want to just stress. The second one is also mentioned the presence of phosphorus as a hidden source of phosphorus in drugs. Because we can say this is anti-partensive drug. No phosphorus. You will be astonished. You will find a lot of phosphorus within the tablet or the product of certain of the tablet from other companies. To the extent one of the present drugs include even 100 milligrams of phosphorus. And the multivitamins. And multivitamins. You and shouldn't yes. be taking any multivitamins. And there is an important point that was published a couple of years ago. And it is uh, speaking about the, the article uh, stressed upon policy forum that companies, we should stress on companies to write phosphorus within the leaflets because in this center they reviewed 200 medications that they are common medications in dances and they found that phosphorus is only mentioned in a minority of the drug, in minor fraction of drugs and they do test for the presence of phosphorus for all these drugs and they found a lot of mishap, hidden phosphorus is there. And this, uh, uh, and this article uh, addresses that we should press on the companies to mention the constituents of everything in the reference. So this is another important hidden, hidden source for phosphorus. Another point, I think, it is our role to educate our patients more and more to read the constituents of every food and every drug. It's very important to educate your patients more and more because they are the one who are consuming this food and the drugs. So it's very interesting uh, issues that you have raised tonight. And the medications that you have in practice, like anti-hypertensive medications and other medicine, that, for example, amlodipine and other medications actually contains some phosphate in it. So it has to be highlighted also by the, the pharmaceutical companies. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yes. Fibers, if we can use them without fear of 
gas was not abscess or hyperterremia because the sources are either bland, organic in the majority of uh,